Thanks for joining us again on Shannon's Club TV, where we look back on the road and race histories of significant cars in Australia. Join us as we examine the defining points of our feature car and take a road trip with a proud enthusiast. We'll also get a market update from the Shannon's auctions team. Now in today's episode, the British sedan which used American V8 muscle to add a sporting edge, the Rover P6 and P6B. There is a case to be made that the Rover P6 2000 of 1963 was the last truly great new British car. The P6 was initially available only as a two litre manual, but both a twin carburetor TC version and automatic transmission were on offer by 1966. These cars brought Rover new hope, not only for the home market, but also for exports, especially to North America. The Rover 2000 was one of a pair of important new upper middle class compact saloons that appeared at the 1963 Earls Court Motor Show, the other being the Triumph 2000. Both used two litre engines, the Triumphs being a six and boasted plush interiors. With its four wheel disc brakes inboard at the rear and a D on rear end, the Rover was the more sophisticated of the pair. More sophisticated maybe, Mark, but did it have potential as a competition car? Well, not really, not initially. I mean, you're talking about a luxurious sedan that weighed about you know, 1.3 tonnes with a little two-litre four-cylinder engine. Having said that, we did see the twin carburetor models in action in UK rallying and indeed the 1968 London to Sydney rally. But for circuit racing, it needed something more under the bonnet, which it got, of course, and I'll get to a bit later. While the elegant but slow P5 3 litre launched in 1958 exuded Rover brand values epitomised in the 1949 Arty P4 Rover, the P6 was aimed at younger clients with perhaps a deeper interest in driving dynamics and technology. Unfortunately, the P6 was also rather leisurely, even though it could be wound out to 105 miles per hour. The twin carb TC went harder, but more urge again was needed for both the P5 and the P6. In 1963, Managing Director William Martin Hurst visited Mercury Marine in Wisconsin seeking marine engines. There he spotted a compact 3.5 litre ex Buick V8. Once he was sure it could be squeezed into both Rovers, he bought the rights to it. Rover engineers, under supervision from Buick ex-chief engineer Joe Turley, reworked the V8 for superior top-end performance. Unfortunately, the P6B was automatic only until 1971 when the 3500S was introduced, a year after the launch of the facelifted Mark II. It had taken almost eight years for the brilliant P6 to achieve its real potential as one of the best sports sedans in the world and arguably the last truly great British car. Mm. Mark, did planting a light aluminium V8 in the P6 attract the attention of any race teams? Well, it sure did. And it was none other than British Leyland's own competition department. Following the release of the Rover P6B in 1968, British Leyland's competition's boss, Peter Browning, saw considerable potential for the car in international touring car racing, with its lightweight aluminium V8 offering an enviable power to weight ratio and handling benefits. Under the Liberal Group 2 rules, Browning's team turned a stripped out P6B into a formidable British contender, with a 4.3 litre engine fed by four Weber carburetors, uprated suspension and brakes, and large mudguard flares to cover enormous wheels and tyres. Its first and only outing was a gruelling 84-hour endurance race at Germany's Nürburgring in 1970. The Rover V8 left a multi-car Porsche works team in its wake as it built a massive three-lap lead, only to suffer a drivetrain problem which forced its retirement after 16 hours. Even so, it was the talking point of the race, prompting expectation of more cars and more races. Sadly, it was not to be, as British Leyland promptly shut down its UK competitions department that year, and the exciting P6 Rover V8 factory program died with it. John, looking back, 
you know, talk about biting off more than you can chew. Wouldn't it perhaps it have been smarter for them in its first race to go in something shorter than an 84-hour endurance race? I think so. <laughs> <laughs> that was extraordinary. Do you think it'll hold up for 84 hours? Well, well, it, it actually retired after 16 hours, so it would have been like a 6-hour or 12-hour race. Would have, it would have walked off into the distance and... and um, changed history. It could well have changed history. history. Yeah. Having said that, though, it's interesting because even though that program you know, was unsuccessful... About a decade later, we did see the 3.5-litre Rover V8 in the SD1 model, which yes. was quite a successful race car. So yes. maybe it was just too far ahead of its time. That's right, <laughs> yes. The P6B factory racer was given a second chance of success by Leyland Australia, which was selling the same model in local showrooms and wanted to promote its performance on the racetrack in local sports sedan racing. After a major publicity blitz, the British imports' early race outings in 1971 did not live up to the hype, as driver Jim Smith was no match for the fastest locally built cars, like Bob Jane's Repco V8-powered Tirana XU1. In response, the Rover underwent some drastic surgery, with a mid-mounted 5-litre Repco Holden V8, open-wheeler-style suspension and major weight loss. However, despite the huge modifications and some new sponsorship from tobacco giant RJ Reynolds, the British car was still no threat to the country's top sports sedans, and in 1974, Smith gave up on the project. Even so, one can't help wonder what might have been had British Leyland explored the clearly untapped potential of the Rover P6B in international touring car racing. Don't forget, you can join the conversation on the Shannon's Club forums with a host of interesting topics. I'm Mike and this is our 1970 Rover P6B in Brigade Red with a buckskin interior. electronic ignition and uh, electric fuel pump. It's been repainted twice. It has four-wheel disc brakes, of course, a Didion rear suspension, which gives you the advantage of an independent rear end, but keeps the wheels parallel at the same time. There's a spare wheel mount on the boot lid. It was introduced in England for continental touring. It gives you a lot more space in the boot and it looks quite interesting when mounted. It's got a three-speed Borg Warner automatic transmission because when they were first released, they didn't have a manual that would handle the torque of the, the V8. I loved the shape of them when they came out. And then when the V8s came out, that really made it because they're an attractive car and they had a bit of performance as well. Handles very well, cruises very well, and still for a car that's 48 years old, can keep up with modern traffic. They're a fairly compact car, which is good. They've got a terrific turning circle. So I've been a Shannon's customer since 1985. and have had fantastic history with them. I think the car's going to stay in the family. Our kids are committed to keeping it in some form or another. I don't think we'll ever sell it. It's sort of become a family heirloom, if you like. Well, Shannon's National Auctions Manager, Chris Borobon's dropped by to bring us right up to speed on the Rover P6. Welcome, mate. Hey, Mark, how are you? Yeah, drop. Welcome, Chris. Four-cylinder and V8, the Rover P6 mm. and the P6B. Yes. Which are the most sought after, if any? The V8, I think, model is, is really probably the one that the enthusiasts are looking for. Mm. Um, and, and again, you know, we had the uh, 3500S variant uh, with the manual gearbox. Mm. So, again, that's probably the rarer one to find today. I think Rover had a lot of trouble from the beginning with that car getting it right, getting enough mm. performance. Because when it first came out, it was a four cylinder only yeah. with a manual. Then you got yep. the twin carburetor version. And when, the, when they put the 3500 engine in it, it was only available with a three speed auto. <laughs> yep. To yeah. start off with, it took them years to mm. do the manual. So all 3500S is their manuals. 
Mm. And that would be the most sought after model, I'm sure. And, and quite rare to find today. I mean, we, we really do not mm. see any of them come through. Um, f- for the rare P6Bs we've had come through the auction, uh, predominantly have been uh, the autos. Mm. Yes. Um, so, yeah, so 3500S, yeah, if you can find it, maybe that's probably one to hold on to. Quite an interesting car from a technical viewpoint, you know, with the d- 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 on d- rear d- end d- and that really unusual bell crank front suspension, because yep. at one stage they were designing it, I think, for a gas turbine engine and they wanted this <laughs> huge engine base. So and the bolt on panels, like a, like a Citroen DS. Yeah, four, four, four wheel disc car. brakes. So, yes. yeah, there's, yep. a, there's a lot of good things about the engineering of that car. I, I think probably the, the sound out of those Rover engines mm. is probably one of the best things, you know. It, um, yeah, you know, they look quite smart. Compact British saloon, mm. uh, lovely style old steel wheels on them uh, as well. Um, yep. Probably not the ideal family classic because you got first you've got to get your family in. Yes. Yeah, they're quite, they're quite very small. cramped interior. Yeah. Yeah. It, it yeah. was quite a, a, it felt like a smaller cockpit compared to the previous P5 model. Mm. Um, you know, and I think it was always going to be a hard one to follow on from the P5, uh, you know, because they, they were quite a pretty car in the coupe especially. Is, that, is the P5 B, the, the coupe is that is that a bit collectible now? Uh, absolutely, I think the P5B really is is probably the f- the favourite oh, car. Is that uh, right? Yeah. That's more desirable. That's than right. The P6, P6, yeah. Okay. So it's got a stronger following. And it's um, very interesting. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. so some wanted a P6 or a P6B. What's the uh, spare parts situation in Australia like? And and the club scene. I know Rover has a very dedicated. Um, it does, and, and, yeah. and I think you know we, we find that most of those cars do change hands, you know, privately within. or within yeah. within the club circles. So, do you uh, ever see them over the blocks at Shannon's? We we have had them over the years. Yeah, they, they have come uh, come through, but but probably not as often as. Uh, you know, we, we would tend to see some other models. Okay. Um, so I think they're, you know, really tightly held through the club. Uh, and I believe there is quite good support throughout the club uh, Australia-wide for them. And what should people look for if they wanted, particularly the V8 model? Because, you know, whether it's true or not, there has been some question marks over the, the long-term reliability of the alloy V8. Yeah. So if it's not looked after, obviously. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, so I think maintenance is probably a big thing on mm. those cars, you know, a, a mechanical maintenance. And, and again, you know, Again, body-wise, also in suspension. So make sure they get out the paperwork Absolutely. and show. Yep. Yeah, all and the have a look. You know, history. a car that's had great service history, yep. been maintained by the right specialist, and be really, it's sort of not the sort of car you can really take to anyone. Mm. And have someone who's got fairly good knowledge on those engines. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, because the car, as you said, we've just got a DD on the rear end, mm. and it's a, it's not the norm. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Quite specialised. Okay. Well, thanks, Chris. And remember, you can get all the latest auctions news from the Shannon's Club website. If you want a lasting memory of the Rover P6 or P6B in competition, check out the huge archive at autopix.com.au. John, reflecting on the Rover P6, sort of like the Triumph and a lot of those brands that came under the British Leyland umbrella, they just... T- tended to lose their identity, didn't they, over time? It, it was so fascinating that the British industry was so diverse mm. that through the 1950s, Rover and Triumph were both planning this new executive-type saloon mm. with two leaders, and yet the cars, while they could they could be and were compared, they were actually very different cars mm. with a very different engineering philosophy under, underlying them. And the interesting thing is, of course, that finally they were replaced by the... The Rover SD1. The SD1, they yeah, covered both bases. Yes. But boy, you know, I mean, those brands were so damaged under the British Leyland system. I mean, the, the quality control in the last of those, uh, you know, P6Bs was just atrocious. Appalling. Yeah. yeah, such a tragedy. I mean, really, the uh, the Rover P6 had fantastic potential. Mm. You know, it really was quite a lovely car. Mm. Yeah, it was quite a sad end, wasn't it, yeah. to the British Leyland? Yeah. Well, we hope you've enjoyed reflecting on the Rover P6 and P6B. We look forward to your company next time on Shannon's Club TV. Bye for now.